Earlier this year, on a morning just before Easter, a woman named Laura Esquivel traveled to the Vatican. She's 57, originally from Paraguay, and Laura was with Anthony Fiola, the post bureau chief in Rome. They were waiting to meet with Pope Francis. And Anthony asked Laura, Do you think he'll remember you? Laura said, Yes. He'll remember me. But Laura and Anthony weren't alone. Lots of people were there. It was part of this weekly opportunity to see the Pope at the Vatican. Typically, these Wednesday audiences are held on St. Peter's Square, where you've got the colonnade and you've got the incredible dome over St. Peter, where there are seagulls usually spiraling around it. And, you know, because there was so much rain, they moved the audience inside this vast papal audience hall inside the Vatican. And its vastness is, you know, it almost feels like an an airplane hangar. It's that large. (laughs) Laura and Anthony were seated in the front row. And eventually, Pope Francis, who's now 87, came out in a wheelchair. His health has not been great. He has been fighting, you know, lingering bronchitis and influenza. But on this particular day, he was extremely jovial. He was cracking smiles as he was going person to person in the wheelchair. And it was interesting because when he got to Laura, he sort of, you know, reels back in his chair with a big smile and with recognition. He clearly remembered her, but she repeats this line, you know, do you remember me? She's so taken with him in that moment. He's asking how she is. They talk about the empanadas uh, that she had baked for him previously. And she then asks for a blessing, and he graciously lifts his hand uh, to her forehead, makes the sign of the cross. Um, She tells him, anytime you want more empanadas, just let me know, right? And, you know, just, it's this sort of, special moment that they share. It is not long, but at the same time, even with that brevity, you can feel the emotion in it. This was Laura's third time meeting with Pope Francis. And part of what made these meetings so extraordinary is that Laura is a transgender woman. She was at the Vatican that day, but her home for the past few years had been in Torvionica. It's this seaside town in Italy where Laura also worked as a sex worker, her profession for years. Laura is just one of a group of transgender women, many current or former sex workers, who have been welcomed to the Vatican by Pope Francis, even as the Catholic Church itself remains pretty conservative when it comes to LGBTQ rights. But the Pope, he is making a concerted effort to connect with people like Lauda, who have traditionally been rejected by the church. And it fits very closely with what, you know, has been the main theme of Francis's papacy, which is an open-door policy, um, mm-hmm. a policy that, you know, anybody has the right to be a member of the Catholic Church. And he decided to walk the walk um, by inviting these transgender women um, to regular meetings with him. And as of now, uh, there are almost a hundred of them that have met with the Pope. Uh, After nearly a decade of, let's say, changing tone and changing the style of the office, what you see in recent months is a Pope who is now entering sort of a different phase of his papacy, where he is translating some of those changes in tone into substance. From the newsroom of The Washington Post, this is Post Reports. I'm Martine Powers. It's Tuesday, May 7th. Today, how a group of trans women became friendly with Pope Francis, and how that has prompted a backlash inside the church. Anthony told this story to my colleague, Alahe Izadi. Before we go any further, I would love for you to tell me just a little bit about Laura Esquivel. Just put me, give me the basics of what I need to know about Laura just in the beginning. 
She's she's had a hard life. She is a transgender prostitute who began working the streets at age 15 in Asuncion, Paraguay, and was you know rejected by her family. Um, she then immigrates to Europe, and she spent time between this town, Torvajanica, which is both near a gay beach and near a army barracks. And so, you know, the trade sort of gravitates there, as well as Milan and some other cities in, in Italy where, for the last several decades, you know, she worked as a prostitute to sustain herself. Otra parte, segundo, mi obligación fue prostituirme para ganarme el pan cotidiano, el pan de cada día. She's a tough woman. She is not someone who feels she needs to repent for her life. She doesn't feel the need to apologize for who she is. She also was someone who, before the meetings with the Pope, had, in her words, lost her faith, uh, both in God and in the Church. You know, Anthony, before we learn more about how... Laura really connected with Pope Francis and and how this all played out. I would love to have a little more context about Pope Francis himself. What kind of pope has he been when we, you know, compare him to the popes who came before him? Yeah, so I was fortunate enough um, to to be working for the post in Buenos Aires when he was Cardinal Bergoglio. He was known for these gestures such as washing the feet of prostitutes or washing the feet of, of patients with HIV. You know, Pope Francis embraced this notion of humility. Um, and then he becomes Pope. The day he became Pope, I was in Rome actually covering the story. And this was back in 2013. Fratelli e sorelle, buonasera. And it was very quickly obvious that he was not going to be a conventional pope. He refused the finery of the office, right? The red slippers. You know, he moved from the lavish papal apartments to the Casa Santa Marta, which is a more humble dwelling behind a gas station in Vatican City. I remember, you know, for instance, back in 2013, you know, after he became Pope, there was this, uh, a few days later, there was what they call the blessing of the journalists, right? So we all went into that same audience hall where I was with Laura. And there was this one fascinating moment where, you know, there's a blind, I believe it was an Italian radio journalist with a seeing eye dog. And he pulls this guy on stage with the dog, right, for a blessing. And then he, besides blessing the man, he goes and he starts blessing the dog, right? And all the journalists start laughing. And you can see the sort of, the, the lack of comfort that some of the Vatican officials had with him showing that sort of more, more I don't want to say irreverent, but it was, you know, a little bit more playful side, you know? Or, or like a casual sort of... Exactly, uh... exactly, or exactly. Like a casual, there, there is that aspect to him as Pope. He doesn't stand on ceremony. And I think that's essentially what we've seen from Francis from the very beginning. And this has been a very unconventional papacy. What you're describing is, in some ways, his style. But I'm curious about the substance of that and what he has said, specifically as it relates to LGBTQ rights. What has he said? And then how is that borne out? You know, we're more than 10 years out of him becoming Pope. So so what has he said about LGBTQ rights before and, and how is that borne out? Yeah, it, it's, a, it's a complicated dichotomy, right? Because he's still the Pope of a church that has doctrine that considers homosexuality to be, quote, intrinsically disordered, but shortly after becoming Pope, Pope Francis is on a uh, trip to Brazil, and it's his first papal trip. He is returning on the papal plane, and he's speaking to journalists. And at that point, in response to a question about gay priests, he answers by saying, who am I to judge? Si una persona es gay, es cerca al Señor, es, es a buena voluntad, ¿qué soy yo para juzgarla? 
And in that statement, um, he is basically, I think, beginning what would become, you know, sort of a, a decade long journey that he would take with the LGBTQ plus community that would eventually lead to some of the changes that we are only now seeing. For one, um, he has backed in writing and verbally um, support for same-sex civil unions outside of the church. Um, He has spoken out against um, laws that criminalize um, homosexual activity. Um, He has additionally backed um, same-sex blessings, which has caused a deep rift in the church with conservatives. Um, and in addition, you know, he has done other things. For instance, explicitly said that transgender people can be godparents and can be baptized. But the path was lined with, let's say, you know, one step forward, two steps back occasionally, right? Because in 2015, the Pope calls gender theory, you know, tantamount to nuclear weapons, right? Um, it's a really complicated theological argument, but the basic fundamentals of what they're saying is that they don't want to negate the differences or the personal histories of of who people were born as. Um, so, you know, it has not all been one strident line in which this Pope is seen as being a friend to the gay community. Mm. So, Anthony, I would love to go back to the story of Lara, this woman you met, and and learn more about how it was that she ended up connected with, of all people, Pope Francis. Because I would imagine, I mean, me just being my lowly self in the United States, that it's not easy to get in touch with the Pope. So how did this connection even come about for her? Well, it all starts with the pandemic. And it starts with the fact that, you know, at the time, because of restrictive laws in Italy, you know, due to the pandemic and social distancing, obviously that didn't mean um, great things for the prostitution trade at the time. And so you had a large number of transgender prostitutes in Torvajanica, this seaside town, who were desperate. Um, Their source of revenue had been cut off. And they had gone to one Catholic church to sort of seek whatever food or money they could try to get to keep going. They were initially rejected, but they then later heard of a more liberal priest, Don Andrea is his name. That's how they call him. Um, And, you know, uh, he accepted them for who they were and, in fact, began to supply them with foods and medicines, etc., Um, partially the food that he was giving out, uh, he was receiving from the Papal Office of Charities. And then when one of them went back and told some of her friends how welcoming he had been, more came and more came. And then eventually, Laura came as well. What would then happen after the assistance they were getting from this church is that this priest, this Italian priest, made a connection with a French nun who had already known the Pope um, for years. And, you know, through discussions that they had, the transgender women were thinking, we would like to write to the Pope and we would like to express our gratitude for the food and et cetera that you've been giving us. So this French nun, um, Sister Genevieve, she decides to take four of these transgender women um, to a meeting with the Pope in 2022. I mean, they're all a little nervous, right? Because they don't know how the Pope is going to react. But then... He does react, and he reacts in a very positive way. And in fact, in a subsequent conversation, when he speaks with Sister Genevieve, he tells her, you know, let's not just have these four. I mean, bring them all. Bring all of these women, these transgender women who you're ministering. Bring them all to meet me, right? He says it three times. Bring them all, all, all. And so they begin to do this, and they begin to arrange for regular meetings. And Lauer was in one of the first groups to meet the Pope. And at that meeting, you know, what's interesting is the Pope never tries to judge her. She says that he tells her, you also are a child of God. He then blesses her on the forehead. Um, You know, what she recalls from that meeting was sort of quiet tears streaming down her face. This is not a woman who's used to crying. 
Um, and that's the way she says it. And to be moved to that extent is a rare thing for her. That's so interesting because if we think about Laura, I'm curious about how she responded to, you know, one, receiving this food and money from the Vatican. What was what was her response? And then what is her relationship with Catholicism? And, and how did this um, interaction impact and influence that? Her initial response is surprise that, you know, the Catholic Church that has not always embraced her or embraced people like her would begin to help her survive, A, with food, and then subsequently with money. Um, and she begins to also experience other dramatic factors in her life that almost make her turn further towards spirituality. For instance, she gets this cancer diagnosis last year on top of living with HIV. You know, what happens at that point is there is a clinic at the Papal Office of Alms which provides her with some initial medicines, some tests related to her cancer diagnosis. In addition to that, um, the church sources a hotel where she's able to stay for 45 days during the worst of her chemotherapy treatments where she's, you know, served breakfast in bed. And after that, you know, the church then helps her source a private room in a shelter not far from the Vatican so she can continue her treatments um, for cancer. And what I think this does is, you know, it makes her see, I guess, the church in a very different way. She's a woman who had talked about losing her faith prior to this, right? And there's a reason for that. Um, you know, she has had a very tough life. She's experienced sexual violence in her work. She has also experienced, you know, other forms of um, difficulties, I mean, being mugged, being robbed. So she didn't have really faith in much. And then you have the church, the Vatican, even now the Pope entering this picture. So you you can understand the leap that it takes for someone to go from feeling more like, not necessarily an outcast, but almost that, right? To this, you know, to this other reality that she's living today. After the break, how Pope Francis's outreach to people like Lauda is causing a stir inside the Catholic Church. We'll be right back. So, Anthony, I also want to pick up this line of criticism that Pope Francis has is taken on for what he's doing. And I'm wondering how, you know, his, both what he's saying, his rhetoric and his outreach, um, that is, you know, he's trying to be more open and more welcoming, how that has been received inside the church and in, in the Vatican and also just around the world. Yeah, uh, there's no question that, you know, Pope Francis has weathered, I think, more and sharper criticism than any other modern pope, mostly because elements in the church have strongly rebelled against him, sometimes using, you know, words that you would, you know, really never hear hurled against, you know, John Paul II or Benedict XVI. I mean, they would call the pope a heretic, um, basically hashtag not my pope, right? And they would disavow a lot of these things that he was saying, arguing that they were contrary to Catholic doctrine, including the LGBTQ outreach, right, that he's mm. been doing. I mean, the, the main criticism that you will hear is that the Pope is sowing confusion in the church by doing these acts and gestures that seem to contradict the doctrine of the church. His argument, of course, is that it's not contradiction. But what they would counter-argue is that, for instance, in the situation of the transgender women, several of them, like Laura, 
um, do not consider themselves repentant. And the argument of the conservative clerics is, how can you embrace and open the door to an unrepentant sinner? And, you know, their argument is that what he is doing is in some ways legitimizing and justifying who they are. And in fact, it becomes more confusing when you see the recent ruling that the Vatican made that basically condemns gender-affirming medical treatment or gender-affirming operations as potentially violations of human dignity, right? So the argument is, how can you say one thing and then do the other? Like, there's a contradiction there. Absolutely. I mean, I think, you know, and to the average person, it would seem that there is a contradiction, right? I mean, the reality is that dogma of the Catholic Church has not changed. I mean, this is still a church that believes that only a man and a woman can marry, right? And that frowns even on divorce. What it is is a reminder that in some ways, this is still your grandfather's church. And that doctrine has remained consistent. But I think what Francis is trying to do is walk this tightrope. You know, Francis has always sought to separate the doctrine from outreach, saying that anyone is welcome, you know, even if you run afoul of church teaching. So he would argue that this is not contradictory, that, oh, you know, he's, not, he's in fact not changing the dogma of the church, but the way in which people engage with the church. In its simplest form, it's sort of hate the sin, love the sinner. So just thinking about, I mean, frankly, how old Pope Francis is, I'm wondering, Anthony, what your sense of whether his actions will constitute his legacy. Like, what will be the legacy of Pope Francis? I think Pope Francis's legacy is going to be about his main themes, which, you know, essentially are the open-door policy of the church and mercy. Um, you know, this is also a pope that brought a global South worldview to the Vatican. He has in many ways, for instance, embrace the cause of migrants. He has embraced the cause of the poor in ways that I think probably exceed the focus of previous popes. Um, he has condemned um, savage capitalism, corporate greed. This is the Lorax Pope, right, who, you know, adopted green policies, uh, not only at the Vatican, but, you know, additionally taught that pollution was a sin and has repeatedly argued to world leaders that they need to move much faster at reaching global climate accords and being more ambitious. I think he's going to be viewed as a pope of his time, a pope that, you know, didn't necessarily try to hold the church back in a time when um, the world had begun to think differently about things like, you know, LGBTQ rights, for instance. And in that sense, it feels like, in some ways, his outreach with these transgender women is a microcosm of that legacy. Mm, yeah. Anthony, it's so interesting because I'm just thinking back to the time that you spent with Laura and the other trans women who have met with the Pope. And, you know, I think it can be easy sometimes for folks to digest stories like this and sort of flatten it into conclusions about faith and spirituality and identity and say, well, these are obvious contradictions. But at the same time, these things are very personal and internal. And I, you know, we can miss the nuance of a person's individual journey. So I, I just wonder in you reflecting on the time that you spent um, with Laura and these other women, what are you sort of left with in thinking about, about the nuance here? I mean, what I'm left with is the power of acceptance of a leader like the Pope and the impact that that has on the psyche of people who are used to rejection and used to being, uh, in the words of one of the transgender women, looked down upon. And to see the way in which that has enriched their lives. It's difficult to measure the impact because, you know, in a way, some of the transgender women will find their way more to church than others, right? For others, it's, you know, an interesting afternoon. But for some, it becomes you know, a more impactful moment that offers some level of kindness in their lives. And 
many of them are not used to kindness. And to have that given to you by a global leader like Pope Francis is something that I think they see as a very powerful gift. Hmm. I would love to end on what Laura's current situation is, to go back to Laura and where she's at. Laura is a woman who still um, feels quite ill because of her cancer treatments. She has difficulty walking longer distances. She spends much of her time in her shelter. She's in a period of uncertainty, um, but she has very much rediscovered her faith. She goes to Mass when she's feeling uh, well enough to do so. She prays a rosary that was given to her as a gift from the Pope. Um, she really does, in many ways, you know, speak and sound like a person who has found her faith again. Um, and what's interesting is that when I first met her, which was back in November, and then in subsequent meetings, you know, I would ask her whether or not she had any thought of leaving prostitution. Um, and, you know, she would always say that when she got better, she was going to go back to the life and, you know, uh, no issue. But what was interesting, on the morning that we met the Pope, she f was feeling a little bit more introspective. And, um, you know, some of the clerics, uh, some of the Catholic clerics that had been ministering to her, I think, you know, had also been speaking to her about, you know, what her options might be for the future. And at the time, she was reflecting on maybe it was time to retire and, you know, move to Paraguay, you know, and try to make a go of it there. She's at a crossroads in her life. And, you know, I don't think that crossroads really would have been there without not only the meetings that she had with Pope Francis, but also the intervention that her local Catholic parish had. I think it made her think in some fundamentally new ways. She never felt uh, in any way that she was coerced into that life. In fact, she would talk um, about how at times she enjoyed her work, right? Um, so hey, people are complex. You can't always see, you know, inside their brain and understand immediately you know, what drives them. Um, but what is clear is that there's a thought process happening inside of her head in which she's reflecting on different pathways that she would not have been reflecting on without the experience that she's had over the last two years. Well, Anthony, thank you so much for sharing your reporting with us. Thank you. I appreciate it. Anthony Fiola is the Rome Bureau Chief for The Post. He spoke with my co-host, Alahe Izadi. Before wrapping today's show, we want to take a moment to turn to Gaza. Israeli forces have taken control of the Rafah border crossing. For context, Rafah is a small city in southern Gaza, bordering Egypt. And right now, more than a million Palestinians have taken shelter there. So why is Israel set on attacking Rafah? Israeli officials say that it's key to their goal of eradicating Hamas. They've said that Hamas has battalions there and is operating tunnels under the border with Egypt. And on Tuesday morning, after Israeli forces took control of the Gazan side of the border crossing, an Israeli official said their forces had discovered Hamas infrastructure. But world leaders are warning that an Israeli military attack on Rafah could devastate civilians. On Tuesday, U.N. Secretary General Antonio Guterres told reporters it would be, quote, a humanitarian nightmare. That's it for Post Reports. Thank you so much for listening. And don't forget, we'd love if you could take our listener survey. You can find it at WashingtonPost.com slash podcast survey. Today's show was produced by Peter Bresnan. It was mixed by Sean Carter and edited by Monica Campbell. Thank you also to Marisa Bellack. I'm Martine Powers. We'll be back tomorrow with more stories from The Washington Post. Um.